Hey class, welcome back to Electric Magnetics. So this will be the last lecture of part eight. And we'll wrap up uh, our progression of looking at uh, electromagnetic waves propagating through dielectric uh, slab, slab guide. Hey class, so we're going to do a quick historical background. This one's kind of a twofold one, so we'll look at that. Uh, the first one is a gentleman that was University of uh, Leiden or Leiden, I guess they pronounce that. And uh, this is his image here. And his name is Willebrord Snellius. He lived from 1580 to 1626. And so the notable thing uh, with this gentleman is he rediscovered Snell's Law. Now, maybe you notice it looks like it was named after him, and it actually was. And for the longest time, uh, he was attributed with discovering Snell's Law, but what we've since found out is he really rediscovered it and what i mean by that well there was another gentleman <coughs> that uh, documented this first as far as his education he was part of all that we know about him was that he was a muslim mathematician uh, i was not able to find uh, an image of him but uh, his name was M ibn sal i guess is how you pronounce that i don't really know uh, but he lived from 940 to 1000 AD. Of course, the notable thing uh, with him was that it was discovered in some of his writings or his recordings that he actually uh, documented Snell's Law or that relationship first. Of course, the name of his document was On Burning Mirrors and Lenses. I'm not sure what that's all about. But uh, here is a, a page from that where he's actually setting up the geometry for Snell's Law. Of course, it's in Arabic, I guess, or some other language. But uh, pretty interesting that, you know, as we learn more, sometimes we find out that uh, maybe we weren't the first to discover things. <clears throat> so in this uh, little lecture, we want to revisit this critical angle because I want to touch on... Uh, a field that's very uh, important to us as far as electromagnetics. So we remember this critical angle. Uh, again, this is where we start to experience uh, this uh, total uh, internal reflection along the boundary. And it's basically uh, boils down to uh, a relationship or a ratio of the primitivities of two different mediums. So we need, as we look at this, as we increase this angle, not only does it reflect along the boundary, but we can actually get it to reflect, you know, that one polarization at least totally back into uh, the first medium uh, at the same angle. So what the, the clever idea that uh, engineers had was, well, what if we stack these dielectric slabs? So what does that mean if we were to stack it? Well, what if we create like another type of waveguide? So this is what's known as a dielectric waveguide. So we have this first uh, condition here where we come up at this critical angle. And remember, we're going to have, uh, if we had total just at the critical angle, the parallel polarization would just go right along the boundary. But what if we even increase that angle? That is, our angle is greater than this critical angle. Well, it'll start to bend it back, so it won't just go down, it'll actually reflect it back. And if we do the same thing here, so here we've got the same type of material on top and bottom and a different material in the middle, we can actually make this start to reflect back over and over and over, and we can guide the wave down our waveguide this way by using uh, total internal reflection. Well, you would think that you'd just be able to easily propagate down uh, down the uh, guide, um, but to achieve full propagation is a little more trickier than that because what we've, if you go back and look at the math, when we hit this total internal reflection here, uh, we actually cause a little bit of a phase shift. And so what that means is, you know, if we were to come in and uh, if, if we don't have the right phase shift, uh, we come in at this first uh, angle at one, once it hits that phase shift, it's going to make it look like it shifted the wave over to where it's actually coming in at this angle. And so if you keep doing that over and over, the phase shifts are going to be, I guess for lack of a better term, erratic, and they could actually do additive and negative and subtractive addition or superposition on each other. 
So what we have to do is we have to not only uh, find the angle that, or use an angle that's greater than the critical angle, but we also have to find special angles to where uh, this phase shift is 2 pi. Of course, if it's 2 pi, then it looks like it's the same uh, wave. It's not shifted at all. If It's a multiple of 2 pi. So to do that, um, if you work through the math, we have to satisfy this condition here uh, and where we are, this equation is equal to multiples of 2 pi. So we have these modes then that would uh, satisfy this propagation. And if you do work out the math and graph all these different modes and the frequencies that this works at, um, again, I, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but you come up with these graphs like this. So then you start to identify these intersect points to where we meet that condition. We have the 2 pi phase shift and we are uh, and we are um, satisfying the critical angle, which is this line here. And so, you know, at these conditions, we do experience that total internal reflection. So if you were to solve for these, for say for this given example we have here, uh, at these angles, 83, 76, 69, so on and so forth. This is those corresponds to those endpoints on that previous graph, and you will achieve the total internal reflection with no phase shift. So if we now take this dielectric slab waveguide and wrap it around back on itself, this is where we come to our present day. And so when we do that, uh, maybe you've already figured it out by now, uh, this creates a fiber optic cable. So if we take that uh, the top and the bottom and we wrap it on in top of itself. So now we have this inner uh, material, which we call the core. And then we have this outer material, which is called the cladding. And so what is essentially happening is, is we shine a, a source, a light source or laser source into the core and we do it at those certain angles that satisfy those conditions, and it will cause the wave to bounce back and forth between uh, the, the two sides of the cladding down through the core. And of course, to meet this condition, the cladding, which we've shown in the cladding here and here, this is kind of a, a side view of what's going on here. So you have this core, which is some permittivity, and then you have the cladding core, which must be uh, much, much less, or to good if it's much, much less than the core uh, permittivity. And so that's the simple uh, explanation for how fiber optic cable works. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So basically, all of our transmission is migrating to this. I mean, we still use copper uh, transmission lines uh, for a lot of applications, but as the price of fiber is dropping and you're doing renovating and all that, we're putting in more and more fiber because we can get much faster speeds and much greater bandwidths using that. Interesting thing is that this is not really a new concept. Um, we just in the last few decades have learned how to utilize it uh, and had an application for it with uh, digital communications. Of course, originally, um, it was, it was observed with water. Um, we had an experiment, and it's been recreated, where they had a light source, and you had this uh, reservoir, and you allowed the water to leak out into a pan. Well, if you sh shone a light through there, the light would follow the path of the light. And so in that case, the water itself is the core, and you know just the free space air around it was the cladding. And so it caused the, uh, the light to bounce back and forth down through the through the uh, stream of water, and this is a, a picture real life of that happening. It's actually pretty amazing. You can even see here the light bouncing uh, back and forth as it goes along there. So it's it's a pretty fascinating phenomenon that we've uh, definitely been able to utilize. Uh, incidentally, this was first done or first recorded that it was done in 1842 by Jean Daniel Caledon uh, during a fluid dynamics experiment. So he wasn't even really worried about what the light would do. He was studying the fluid dynamics and trying to understand it better. But during that, he observed, hey, this is pretty cool. The light's actually uh, traveling along the stream of water.